is based on nothing but lies. And Satan is the father of lies. Why okay. Why you bad Excuse me, were you there? Ahem. Class is in. Hello my stellar students of all things science and sarcasm, I am the Irreligionist, and today we're talking about, well, a lot of things. Recently I was asked about the evidence that supports evolution and whether or not it actually points a proverbial finger back at this now widely accepted theory. Lies in the textbooks that are used to support the evolution theory, everything that's ever been used as evidence for the theory has been proven wrong. Having no short answer and not wanting to phone in a response, I decided to make a video which has since turned into a three-part miniseries I'm calling Why I Don't Creation. In this series, I will try to explain why evolution seems likely based on the evidence, and I will also attempt to explain why the evidence that has so often been cited for the theory of evolution is valid. We will be looking at several types of evidence, from the layering of rocks, the fossil record, some basic information about evolutionary biology, and even some chronological dating techniques used to determine the age of the Earth, as well as taking a quick look at the scientific method itself all in an attempt to better understand what the theory of evolution actually is, and what it says, and doesn't say, about us as human beings. Trigger warning folks, the Earth is most likely more than 6,000 years old. In today's episode, we'll be looking at the scientific method as well as examining the age of the Earth. Well boys and girls, I don't believe we came from ape-like creatures, I don't believe in evolution, don't believe in millions of years. But before we can do any kind of basic investigation of nature, it is imperative that we make a few assumptions. I know what you're thinking, assumptions are bad, right? Well, in some cases it's necessary for us to make assumptions, and that is not necessarily a bad thing as long as those assumptions are based on observations and not held to some kind of proof. In this case, they are crucial in order to proceed. The first assumptions we must make is that we exist. The second assumption is that the universe exists. And the third is that we can learn something about the universe. If you can make those assumptions, which most people do on a regular basis subconsciously, then great, we can move on to investigating nature. However, if you're not prepared to step out onto that ledge, then you can learn nothing and in fact are nothing and should probably turn off this nothing video and go not exist somewhere else. But if you're still watching, then it's time to talk about the scientific method. You know, how we science. The scientific method, in one form or another, has been around for at least the last few hundred years, since around the time of Galileo Galilei, and may have roots stretching back much, much further. At its core, the scientific method is a procedure or guideline of natural investigation predicated on the idea of forming questions about reality and then trying to test them. We'll quickly run through the basic steps and give a few definitions as we go. The steps of the process normally start with the forming of a question. The question can be an inquiry based on observations such as, why do things fall down? Which is an example we will use for the rest of the steps. It is important to note, however, that the question can be more of an open-ended sort, such as, how do we make things fall up? The question or query is at the heart of any investigation, and the scientific method is essentially a way to answer the questions we have about nature. So it would follow that one would need a question before one could begin to answer it. So now that we have our question, we can move on to step two, which is the hypothesis. A hypothesis, in science, is best defined as a tentative assumption or conjecture made in order to test its logical or empirical consequences. The hypothesis is what we think the answer to our question might be, such as, per our example, that things fall down because of an unknown force pulling them towards the Earth. It is important to know that the hypothesis has to be made in such a way that allows it to be falsifiable, that is, it has to be allowed that the hypothesis can be wrong, otherwise it can't be tested. You're saying, what are you doing? You're insulting my intellect. And so I am. Prediction. The third step of the method is fairly self-explanatory. One makes a prediction of the outcome of testing the hypothesis, defining what one would expect to observe in a particular situation as suggested by said hypothesis. If the hypothesis is that things fall down towards the ground because of an unknown force, then we can predict that running an experiment should show this to be true, that objects once released should plummet to the ground. That being said, the stage is set for our next phase, the testing phase. The testing phase is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. 
This is where observations are made and, assuming the tests or experiments are performed correctly and designed correctly, where the observer can see if the prediction of the hypothesis matches the reality of the outcome. For instance, if all objects drop fall to the ground at the same rate in our imagined experiment, then this would support our hypothesis. If some objects don't conform to this, such as floating straight up upon release, then this would necessarily weaken our hypothesis. In fact, it has been suggested that trying to prove the contrary of your hypothesis is a better approach as it would preclude the tendency towards confirmation bias. Once the experiment is done, then comes analysis, which consists of looking at the data from the test and seeing what the ultimate outcome was and whether or not the hypothesis was supported or refuted by the evidence observed. If the hypothesis is supported, more testing may be needed to confirm or refine the findings, and if the hypothesis is refuted, the new or altered hypothesis may be created to potentially explain the observed results, which is usually the first step in the next round trip of the method. And while this process isn't always followed in that order, these are generally the steps of the method, and it is certainly a method that tends to be repeated, often, as it should be. Also important factors in making investigations into reality are the ideas of replicable results. Failing to be a repeatable process may be damning evidence against conclusions drawn in error. The idea of peer review is also a good way of keeping the results of inquiry honest by having experts evaluate results and experiments. Transparency of any pertinent data is also suggested, making external replication of results possible. The end result, after many iterations of the method have been cycled through and countless experiments and verifications have been performed, may be that the hypothesis you started with, or at least ended with, might contribute to forming a theory to explain the observable. A theory, by the way, is something a bit different as a scientific term than how we use it in our common vernacular. Charles Darwin never thought of evolution as anything other than a theory. He hoped that someday it would be proven by the fossil record. A scientific theory, as defined, is a coherent group of propositions formulated to explain a group of facts or phenomena in the natural world and repeatedly confirmed through experiment or observation. Some people think theories graduate to fact or law. This is incorrect. A theory is the highest level of acceptability given to any explanation offered by the scientific community. By contrast, a law in science is the statement of the observed without the need for explaining the cause of the observed phenomena. A law of gravity describes accurately the effects of the phenomenon of gravity as an occurrence. A theory of gravity attempts to describe how it works, such as the general theory of relativity. But now that we know the method, we can now approach our first creationist conundrum, the age of the Earth. Dinosaurs lived beside people about 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago. According to many biblical literalists, the Earth is only a bit over 6,000 years in age. This doesn't seem to be the case. As early as the 17th or 18th centuries, many scientists were beginning to see a correlation between layered strata of rocks and the age of the Earth, such as geologist John Phillips, who thought the Earth to be at least 96 million years of age, based on fossils found in rock layers around the world and the length of time calculated at that time for those layers to form. This estimation, along with many others like it, ran up against many issues, namely that the Earth isn't static and the strata can become eroded or made otherwise unviable for such estimation. Rock layers laid down at the same time can be quite different in appearance in different locales, and in any one place we can only look at a small portion of Earth's timeline. As other scientists began trying to resolve the age of the Earth with widely different methods, such as salt content of the oceans or the cooling of the Earth from a molten state, as well as different age approximations, from 75,000 years to nearly 3 billion, an important tool would emerge to help aid in the search for the Earth's long-lost birthday. That tool was radiometric dating. The core of radiometric dating, as first proposed by Bertram Boltwood and based on the findings of Ernest Rutherford and others in the early 1900s, uses the radioactive half-life of certain isotopes and rocks to determine their age by comparing how much of the original isotope is left compared to the element left from the chain of decay. This process is generally not subject to the invalidating effects of temperature, high or low pressures, or even the chemical compositions of the surrounding environment. Bertram using uranium 238s decay into lead with an approximate half-life of 4.468 billion years was able to show that certain geological samples were aged up to 2.2 billion years. However, as science progressed in terms of the means of investigation, as other forms of radioactive isotope dating were becoming utilized, and as the sample sizes of the tested material became larger, the dates began to increase from the 2.2 billion years of Bertram's estimations to the figures we have today. We arrive today at the number of 4.54 billion years, give or take a few million years, by having tested several closed system-like samples for their radioactive decay. 
samples that have relatively little influence made upon them by external factors, such as the Martian meteorites found embedded within the Earth, dating to around 4.5 billion years, or even lunar samples or relatively isolated zircon samples on Earth being similarly dated. Which is important as modern cosmology suggests that most terrestrial planets in our solar system were birthed as part of an accretion disk formed around the Sun during its stellar infancy. Which would lead us to think that 4.54 billion years, given a 1% margin of error, would be close to the outside age of our Earth, and by extension would also be around the age of most of our solar system. But besides the various forms of radiometric dating used, we also use an extensive host of other dating techniques. These methods range from archaeological to geological to absolute dating and beyond. They each have some type of use, whether to correlate findings or because some of these methods are quite limited or situational in their application, like carbon dating. How does a dinosaur who died 65 million years ago still have measurable carbon-14 in his bones? Which is a quite limited version of radiometric dating whose measurements are limited to only 50,000 or so years. But we will tackle that creationist quandary eventually. So yeah, I hope I have at least shed a bit of light onto the subject of why I prefer to science. Stay tuned for the next episode where we talk about rocks and also the fossil record. Thanks for watching everyone. Like, comment, subscribe, or don't. But if you do, you could win a brand new car from some unrelated contest or sweepstakes that you would have to enter somewhere else. Have a science-tastic day!